Hi, my name is Rebecca Lucero, and today we're going to be talking about the developmental model of recovery. First, we're going to be talking about life in the drinking stage. A lot of these things you might have already heard throughout the course of the semester, but here we're going to be discussing them underneath the developmental model of recovery and examining all these different working parts um, that help someone to go from addiction into recovery and stay in recovery. So first we're going to talk about the drinking stage. Um, this is the stage where people are going to be denying the existence of any problem with alcohol. They're going to be coming up with a lot of rationalizations or excuses for the behaviors that are going on. And they're going to be covering up the secret that this really is a serious problem. So when people start to think about recovery, um, these are some of the things that we need to look at and so first we have that the family patterns must break down right there's certain patterns and behaviors that are going on in the family right now that sustain the addiction right we call this homeostasis so we've talked about some of these concepts before so what will happen when somebody starts to enter recovery is that the denial that they've maintained for so long is going to begin breaking down at one part of the system. So that may mean that the spouse reaches out and tells someone about the problem, maybe the addict reaches out for help, maybe a child admits to somebody that something is going on in the family, but at some point in the system, somebody is beginning to recognize and give voice to what's really happening. Um, and as one family member moves into recovery, the whole entire system is going to be shaken up a little bit, right? They're all going to have to respond to what it means that we're acknowledging that there's a problem in the family, right? That addiction is, exists. And as the whole, if the whole family ends up moving into recovery, the whole structure of the system will change, right? Um, the homeostasis that maintains the addiction is going to have to change uh, if we're going to be having a homeostasis that maintains recovery. So let's look a little further at the drinking stage. Um, this is where the family is going to be do dominated by an alcoholic environment. There's going to be a lot of anxiety, tension, maybe even some trauma of the act of drinking. You can imagine that in this type of home, right, where there's drug or alcohol abuse or any kind of addiction, there's going to sometimes be things that can't be anticipated, right? There might be violence, um, other things that might just happen, right? We don't know if dad's going to make it to the bedroom. Maybe he's going to pass out on the way there. Um, maybe we don't know how... You know, if mom's an alcoholic, how she's going to react when I tell her something. Um, so there's a lot of anxiety just because it's harder to anticipate what might happen when somebody's intoxicated. Also, we see that the family is going to deny the drinking. Um, and, and what that means is that they may just turn, you know, turn you know, a blind eye to it. So maybe somebody's drinking in the room and I just don't go in that room, right? I might pretend that like this isn't really as big of a deal as it is. This also enables the system to become rigid and organized around the drinking, right? Everything supports that. Um, when there's new information about what the drinking is doing to the family, it's not acknowledged, right? So maybe we find some hidden alcohol bottles, um, but we don't really talk about it, right? Maybe we just move on or don't tell anyone else about it. Also, family members are going to be accommodating the drinking, altering their behaviors to maintain the drinking system. So um, one example of this is that let's say that you know a couple owns their own business and what might happen is let's say the husband is the one who has an alcohol problem and he's so drunk he can't get up to go and open up the business maybe the wife goes and does that and starts doing that for the husband well it kind of makes sense for her to do that because this is her livelihood as well but we see how that also accommodates and enables him in his drinking and so this will this actually comes fairly naturally for family members that they will be doing things that allow the person to drink, but a lot of this is for their own survival, and so it, it makes it really easy for them to justify doing these things that also support the addiction. Um, and that's what can be so tricky about enablers and anyone who's codependent is that there's a lot of good reasons for them to enable the addict um, for their own benefit, and it's really hard for them. It's easier to go into work and open up the store for my drunk husband than it is to think about leaving him or how to get him help or what I would do if I had to support my own family. Um, you can clearly see how it makes sense that sometimes they will accommodate the drinking and, and change in that way rather than changing and upsetting the whole system. In the drinking stage, right, individual growth and well-being are sacrificed the needs of an unhealthy alcoholic system. So when we discuss roles, right, we see that in unhealthy families, people are confined to their roles. 
um, and they're not able to grow in the many different ways that an individual might. Um, so this is kind of a, you know, reiterating some of that. Also, the system feeds on itself. Family problems are systemic, but they're going to be blamed on individuals. Threats to homeostasis are punished by shame, anger, and denunciation. So we see this a lot, like you might see this with teenagers, right? Maybe there's a teen that has a drinking or a drug problem. It's really easy for the family to blame it all on that teen, and, you know, that's, that's our son. He causes us so much pain. It's all on him. Um, instead of recognizing that everybody plays a part in what's going on in the family. Um, so often blame will be thrown around to protect the system, right? To protect what's going on to keep the homeostasis. No one in the family can see the weak, rigid, chaotic, crumbling family foundation. Although some people outside of the family might be very aware of this, right? People outside of the family may be noticing that something's not right with the family and that things are not going well. Um, but within the family, right, they're so used to this that this is the norm. And so they're not really aware of that. So let's talk more specifically about the alcoholic in the drinking stage. So what we see is as far as behavior, right, there's loss of control. There's repeated efforts to gain control. And it's dominated by impulse. So this person, right, is compulsively using whatever substance or behavior um, at this point. And here we're talking about alcohol, obviously. So we see that the behaviors are compulsive. And we kind of talked about this, about the disease model. Um, and, and so this is where that really factors in that this is kind of what's happening, right? They're very impulsive. It's compulsive. Um, they don't really feel like they have control or have the option to not choose to use. Um, we also have that the thinking is going to be ruled for by defenses, right? So everything is going to be, all thoughts are going to be preserving the addiction, right? Denial, rationalization, projection, grandiosity, omnipotence. The addict is going to create a false sense of self that allows this person to continue using. So they'll say things like, I'm not an alcoholic or I'm not like that, right? I'm not a drunk. Um, I can control it. If I wanted to stop, I can, right? Um, that's what they often will tell themselves. Um, as far as emotional expression, we'll see that sometimes there will be unemotional or overly emotional. So sometimes when you're interacting with an addict, there will be nothing, right? They will be very um, unfeeling, right? They don't care about a lot, right? And sometimes that can be because they actually are intoxicated. Or sometimes when they're intoxicated or not intoxicated, they can be overly emotional. So what we see is kind of this emotional dysregulation, right? Um, sometimes emotions don't match what's actually happening. Um, Something that you might also see in, in this instance is that they might overreact to things that are small, but when something is really big, they don't react to it. So let's say somebody dies and they just don't really show emotion, right? But, you know, the dinner's burnt and, and you know, it's the end of the world. And so you'll see that. And, and a lot of what that is is the family rules, right, of don't feel, don't talk, you know, help this person to bottle everything up. And then when they finally um, can't hold it in any longer, it might come out with something, you know, very small and inconsequential. Um, and so sometimes you just see this where the emotions don't really always match what's happening. And so sometimes they'll control or express their emotion through the use of the drug or alcohol. Um, also be aware that emotional disturbances um, may be a cause or consequence of the use, right? So sometimes it's hard to know what's the chicken or the egg. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the co-alcoholic or the enabler in the drinking stage. This person's behavior is marked by doomed efforts to control the alcoholic and others in the family. So this person has been trying to control the family situation. Um, they also might be impulsive and that impulsiveness will dominate their actions. This person can be very emotionally reactive which makes them to be impulsive in their actions. Um, also, as far as thinking, thinking is also dominated by defenses, right? They have a false sense of self, right? That they're the one holding the family together, that they are not the sick one, right? They're the healthy one. Um, so that's often the case as well. Um, again, same kind of emotional expression, right? Because this is how the system operates. These are the family rules, the family boundaries. Um, again, unemotional or overly emotional. Um, a lot of denial, um, a lot of projection of emotions. Um, and they'll often feel depression and a lot of anxiety, fear, and rage, right? A lot of resentment, a lot of rage um, they will feel towards the addict. So children in the drinking stage um, will see that they will be compulsive, rigid, or passive. Um, they might be acting out or they might even turn to, you know, substances themselves. Again, the thinking will be dominated by family defenses. They might show disturbances in thinking because they might be denying reality. They can have difficulty concentrating, hyperactivity, dissociation. Um, 
As far as emotional expression, they will be developmentally skewed, right? They haven't really learned, I mean, they've grown up in a, an environment where emotions were kind of dysregulated, right? Emotions don't really match what's going on. Um, and so they might develop some emotional disorders such as depression, anxiety, sleep disorders. Um, and they're going to need safety and reassurance because that's not what they've been getting in their home. And they're going to be really vulnerable to stress. So let's talk a little bit about transition stage, right? So this is where we're moving out of the drinking stage. So this is where we're going to be seeing a break in the denial, right? People are going to be challenging those core beliefs, um, realizing the family's out of control. They're going to be about to hit bottom and surrender, accepting the reality of the alcoholism and the loss of control, enlisting support outside of the family. There's going to be a shift from the focus on the system to the individuals who begin to form detachment and individual recovery. So when we talk about detachment, we're talking about how there's been some probably some codependency and we're going to be working on becoming more independent, right, um, and moving towards recovery. Also, they're going to be allowing the system to collapse, right? They've had a whole structure, um, way of power operating within their system, boundaries, rules, roles. All of that is going to collapse when they enter recovery, right? That's the whole point of enter recovery, is for all of that to collapse and then to build something that's healthy. Um, they're also going to be learning new abstinent behaviors and thinking. So let's talk about hitting bottom. What happens when you hit bottom? Uh, desperation or crisis cracks defenses, and it's exposing the vulnerability and the loss of control. When all the defenses come down, you're going to see the need for help. Surrendering to this realization is going to force the family to look outside the family for support, right? They're going to realize that they haven't been able to solve this, that things haven't gotten better, and they're going to have to reach out. Um, they're also going to be looking at the need to focus on lack of control so that they can keep vulnerability open and act on it, right? If they're going to be changing the system, they have to be willing to be vulnerable and really look at the system. So they've got to stay vulnerable and stay focused on how they are powerless and in allowing them to become more educated and more thoughtful about the way that their family can be. Um, so if the desperation is allowed to wane, the denial will return, right? Um, okay, we're fixed. We're better, right? Um, that can happen really easily. Um, and so it's really important that the family stays in that place long enough to really make all the changes that they need to. So shifting to recovery, here are some beliefs and messages that are helping people shift to recovery, right? So we're going to be contrasting kind of some previous beliefs with some new beliefs. I am in con I am in control. I'm out of control. I need to control others. I cannot control others. I don't need help. I need help. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic. I need to be defensive. I need to remain vulnerable, right? So we see how there's a big contrast in these thoughts and messages. So let's go ahead and look at the transition stage. Um, the family remains dominated by an alcoholic environment. Um, the environment is more anxious, frightening, and traumatic than during the drinking stage, right? And, and it's important to realize that it's this way, right, because we're shaking up the system. So even though the drinking stage is a bad, you know, would be considered probably a very unhealthy stage and uncomfortable, the truth is it's what this family knows. It's what, the, what they are familiar with. So transitioning at all is going to bring about a little bit more anxiety because they don't know what's happening to the family. They don't know what's going to happen next. So um, it can be very scary to be in a place where you've never been. The growing pressure in the alcoholic system can lead one or more members to hit bottom. The alcoholic family may collapse partially or fully. So that's also important to realize that sometimes when people are in transition stage, sometimes that's when divorces happen, people leave the family, people cut off. Um, we really can't be sure what might happen in any individual family. Um, the full collapse allows the family focus to shift radically, moving away from a family focus to individual recovery. Um, and what's happening here, right, because we talked about how there was a lot of blame before. So rather than blaming other people, each individual is going to be focusing on what they need to do to enter recovery. So when they are focused more on this healthy personal growth, right, um, they're going to be able to focus on themselves and recovery and do their part. Um, so outside help is going to be really important at this point. Um, 12 steps, therapy, any kind of external support that can help them with the recovery. So the family environment in transition in the drinking phase is intense, chronic, and acute trauma and danger. In the abstinence phase, it's still unhealthy, but it's usually less unsafe. And you're still going to have that chronic and acute trauma 
still going to be dominated by chaos and crisis um, because this is just the beginning of the trauma recovery. Okay, so we're going to take a look at the family system and transition drinking. So the system is more unhealthy. Um, there's cracks in the denial. Family structures are collapsing. The individuals are moving toward rock bottom. Um, the rules and the roles are tightening. Um, it's going to be harder to keep the rituals going. It's going to become more strained. The boundaries are blurring, but they're also becoming more rigid to the outside world. Um, the power and hierarchy is confusing, right, because things are shifting. Um, this change can be traumatic and painful because it's the decline of what was previously going on in the family. So um, just being aware that this is, not, this is not an easy transition by no means. So as the family is transitioning to abstinence, um, they're making a healthy move toward recovery, but again, system still unhealthy. Um, there's the trauma of recovery as everything's collapsing. They're looking for external support. Um, so we also need to realize that when the, the system collapse, it's, collapses, it's going to be easy to go back to the old ways or they have to face a vacuum and they have to rebuild. So um, they're, they're kind of faced with that decision. The rules and boundaries are going to be exposed as problematic. The roles are no longer going to be able to work um, out to resolve the problems and keep the homeostasis um, that was maintaining the addiction. The rituals, they're going to be letting go of those. The hierarchies, right, we talked about how the system is collapsing. Um, and the change impacts everything as the family fights to find balance in the midst of trauma. All right, we're going to take a look at the individual in transition during the drinking and abstinence. So during the drinking, they're going to be sacrificing their own development to preserve the system. Dominated by trauma, right, we're going to be defending against surrender, trying to maintain the drinking. There will be cracks in the denial and also maybe some despair and feeling defeated, right? The family has not been able to resolve these issues. Um, but what happens is when they go into transition, we're f shifting the focus to individuals. Um, we're getting external help. We're forming an attachment to recovery and the new recovery identity. This is really an important part, right? That they have this new identity to help them as they are, you know, taking on this whole new, you know, it's going to be important that they take on this new identity of recovery in order to rebuild everything that they just dismantled. Um, also, this is going to be maybe an intense time of dependency. So being aware of that. And there's going to be a lot of depression, anxiety, abandonment, confusion, fear, um, wanting to act impulsively. And a lot of this is because the family is going to be feeling really vulnerable. Um, and this is something that I notice a lot with clients is that when things get dismantled, when there's deep feelings of vulnerability, you will see a lot of fear, a lot of impulse. And so it's going to be really hard for these people because you know, up until this point, they've been using really unhealthy ways to cope. Um, and so being coming more vulnerable and giving up those um, ineffective and unhealthy ways to cope is going to be very difficult. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the alcoholic and transition drinking, so transitioning into the abstinence stage. Um, so we're going to be looking at the behavior, right? There's been a loss of control and out of control behaviors are turning to focus on new abstinent behaviors, right? So we're developing healthy coping skills. Um, but the impulse is still going to be there, right? And so we're going to need heavy intervention to help this person stay abstinent and, and change these behaviors. So the thinking, right, um, we talk about that. We're thinking about those cracks in, in the denial and recognizing that they don't have control allows them to surrender, right, um, and form new beliefs, a new identity, and also learn the language of recovery. Um, as this person is you know transitioning they're going to be holding on to the war stories and turning those into reconstruction of perceptions of the past um, they're going to be building a narrative of what really happened and what is happening now right up until this point um, the addict has been you know telling certain stories about themselves to support the addiction right we talked about that false sense of self and now we're going to be creating a narrative um, that's based in reality of what's happened and what will be happening um, as far as emotional expression Right, we're moving from a place where there were outbursts um, against other people and self, um, and you know, feeling guilty or shame, right? Moving away from this depression and this desperation um, to emotions that are focused on action, 
some may feel pretty happy, but some may still feel pretty depressed. So it's kind of unclear. We know, you know, and, and it may also change, you know, somebody may be feeling really happy and excited about recovery, but also may, you know, feel depressed the next day. And so there's just, you know, that shift from, you know, being really stuck in a shame place to maybe moving to a place where there's more hope, right? Um, hope is really the thing that drives action. If I believe that something will, you know, positively happen, in the way that I think it will, then I then I act right. If I don't think something will happen, then I probably won't act. So, um, you know, gaining a sense of hope um, as they enter into this abstinence um, stage. We're also going to be looking at the co-alcoholic in transition. So, as far as behavior, right? Um, again, going to be looking at accepting that they don't have control over other people, um, looking for outside support and help, um, and the attachment to the alcoholic. Um, which has been so codependent is also going to be lessening, right? Um, as far as thinking, again, um, cracks in the denial, um, a willingness to surrender to and, and forming new beliefs and identity, learning the language of recovery. Um, again, those traumatic stories, they're going to be still holding on to those, but what we're going to be, what they're going to need to be working on is building a narrative of what really happened and what's, you know, going to be happening now. And so this can be really difficult because often the co-alcoholic has built a lot of stories around blaming the addict. And so them learning the language of recovery and learning what their part has been in terms of the family system um, that's maintained the addiction is really important. So you will see that this person is changing some of that thinking and beginning to recognize um, their own own healthy behaviors. As far as emotional expression, again, same type of thing that the addict is going through. Um, you know, prior to this, they probably had a lot of angry outbursts because of the resentment and rage that they felt towards the addict. Also, the shame, right, that maybe they haven't been able to fix it, or that the person, you know, maybe feeling that they're their loved one uses because of them. Um, so they may feel happy about the transition, but they also still might feel a lot of depression or anxiety. Um, I think it can be really difficult for anybody else in the family when the addict gets sober because they're just waiting for the person to use again. Um, so it can be it can be a while before that person actually feels like the addict is serious about recovery. Um, as far as children, let's talk about children going through transition um, towards abstinence. Um, any behavior problems in transition may intensify. Um, in abstinence, the problem may remain or begin in response to the trauma of recovery, right? So this is going to be a big change. It might be very scary for children because they've kind of gotten used to learning how to operate in the family where there was addiction. And now that you're changing things, that can be, um, that can cause acting out. Also, the thinking is dominated by family defenses and disturbances moving toward being frightened and confused. Um, as both parents move toward recovery, they can help the children begin to process um, the repair. As both parents are moving toward recovery, they can help children begin the process of repair. Um, split parents in recovery can also sometimes make the, the problems worse, right? There might be still some blame there, especially if they split up. Um, children may feel a sense of impending doom in transition, um, and they, they very well might feel safe, like we talked about. Um, this is a big change, and they've gotten used to finding ways to maintain safety in, in a chaotic environment, right? They've learned the rules and the roles um, that they've needed to assume to protect themselves the, to their best ability. Um, in abstinence, children are going to need support, structure, and reassurance. And the emotional disturbances may be expressed where chronic trauma remains the normal state of things. So just be aware that, you know, until some of that trauma stuff is, is also healed, um, there might be still some emotional disturbances among children. So that's all we're going to cover in this particular lecture video. So I hope that was helpful at helping you to understand what's going on in the drinking stage and also in the transition stage.